Well, as we continue our study in the book of Philippians, I ran across a quote from Charles Spurgeon, great preacher, and he said this. He said, I've found in my own spiritual life that the more rules I lay down for myself, the more sins I commit. The habit of regular morning and evening prayer is one which is indispensable to a believer's life. But the prescribing of the length of prayer and the forced remembrance of so many persons and subjects may put me into bondage and strangle prayer rather than assist it. Folks, we need to understand that we're not to seek to live up to the standards of men. It's not men's standards that we're accountable to. 1 Samuel 16.7 says this, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so our goal is to examine our heart as it relates to how we serve, as it relates to the Christian walk, as it relates to our lives, our very lives, to examine our heart and our motives. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the book of Philippians. We're in chapter 3. We'll begin chapter 3 today. And I'll read, if you'll follow along, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Just to give us uh, some sense of the context of these comments today, we need to go back and let me review where we've come from in the book of Philippians. At the beginning of his letter, the Apostle Paul expresses this desire for the Philippians to grow spiritually. And he states that he has an, an, an ardent desire for the Philippians to grow in their walk, to grow in their relationship with the Lord. And he, in fact, comes out and says that his imprisonment is part of God's plan for the furtherment of the gospel. In spite of what many think that, that Paul was being constrained from doing what he was supposed to do, Paul says, no, this is all part of God's plan for me to be in prison for the gospel's sake. But he goes on to say that he's conflicted. And he makes this crazy statement to, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And he says, basically, I would rather go on and be with the Lord. If it was up to me, I would just die now and go be with the Lord. But he says, it's better for you that I stay. And so he decides that it's more important for him to remain for the spiritual development, the spiritual growth of those that are under his charge, that have arranged themselves voluntarily under him and are being discipled by him, that are being mentored by him. Then he goes on to give this mandate of unity within the body. And he speaks of the importance that everyone has to, to, to just be a unified body of one mind and one heart. 
And that, that believers should be looking out for the interests of others. And when he thinks in terms of interests of others, it's, we're to look behind the eyes of others and we're supposed to be empathetic toward their needs and their interests and put them ahead of our, of our own interests. And he uses the example of Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who came as the God-man and lived a life in the flesh and suffered, bled, and, and shed his own blood voluntarily for you and I, humbled himself to the point of death on the cross because it was necessary to look out for your and my better interests. And so he uses that as an example. And he goes on to continue and remind the Philippians to put their own interests in the back seat and to put interests of others to the forefront. And he, uh, if you remember, said that this famous quote, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God works in us both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And he's talking about practicing the spiritual disciplines, practicing all of the things that would help us to grow, knowing that the result, the fruit of that, belongs to God and God alone. Last week, he brought a little bit more focus to the specifics of the spiritual disciplines and talking about offering guidance and the importance of someone more spiritually mature than us coming alongside of us and leading us into a deeper relationship with the Lord. And that spiritual discipline of guidance was what he talked about last week. Go back with me, if you will, to chapter 3. And I want to go verse by verse through our text. In verse 1 it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And as he wraps up this letter, you know, the rest of the letter is all thematically along the same line here. But he says, rejoice in the Lord. And he goes on to say, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. And so he's remind, what he's telling us is repetition, friends, is the mother of learning. And a lot of times you'll hear me repeat things and you say, well, there's Pastor Doug on his soapbox again. He's talking about that topic again. But repetition is the mother of learning. And so the Apostle Paul is saying it's very safe for you for me to remind you of the importance of unity. To remind you of the importance of being of one heart and one mind. And to put the interests of others ahead of you goes a long way to that unity that you see. Look at verse 2. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil doers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. What's he talking about there? He's talk he gives us a clue there in the next verse when he talks about the circumcision. When he talks about mutilating the flesh, what he's referring to, he's pointing out, and, and a while back we studied about the Judaizers, about the folks that were saying that you have to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. You have to follow the Jewish law, in other words, in order to be a Christian. You have to do this. And so he's pointing back to this, and he's saying, look out for, and he calls them dogs. He calls them evildoers and he specifies, look out for the folks who say you have to do this, you have to do that. If you're a Christian, then you've got to do this, 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 and this. Otherwise, you're not a Christian. And so he says, watch out for them. And he goes on to verse 3, look at verse 3. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship, how? By the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Let's go back to that. For we are, what does he say? For we are the circumcision. That's the way he says it. They're not the circumcision, even though they've been circumcised. Why aren't they the circumcision? Because it's a circumcision of the heart, friends. It's a circumcision of you and I recognizing whose we are in Christ. And so we're, we're the circumcision who, how? Who worship by the Spirit of God. You see, we're not worshiping in our own power. It is not by your and my power that we do what we do. It's by surrendering control to the Spirit and allowing the Spirit of God to work through us that we offer up a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord God. He says we are the, we're the circumcision because we worship by the Spirit of God and not in our own power. And we glory in Christ Jesus and not in our own power and not in our own will and not in our own desire to do well and look good, see. 
And it goes on to say, and we put no confidence in the flesh. What does it mean? What is he saying? We put no confidence in the flesh. What, we're, what he's saying is, friends, that we put no confidence in your and my ability to please God. We put no confidence in your and my ability to work hard enough or to do well enough for God to say, that's acceptable. <laughs> we put no confidence in the flesh. What does he say? He says, all of our confidence, friends, is in the Spirit of God working in us, in our lives. And by that, and that alone, it, it shows whose we are, see. Let's keep going. Look at verse 4. He says, though I myself, and this is a comparison contrast, he says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. He says, if anyone else has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Listen to what he goes on to say. And is he boasting? No. He's giving us an example here to say, hey, if you think that your standards are good enough, guess what? My standards by the standards you're trying to hold are better than anybody else's. Listen to what he says. He says, if anyone else has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. What is he saying? That, that's specified by the law that he is a born Jew. He is born a Jew. He's not proselytized Jew. He, doesn't, he wasn't circumcised at 13 like some. He wasn't circumcised because he switched religions. He's circumcised because he's a born Jew. And he goes on to say, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Who's from the tribe of Benjamin? King Saul, the very first king of Israel. A Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, I'm the reference standard for being a Hebrew. I'm the reference standard for that. As, as to the law. And a Pharisee. What's that? That's people that keep the law and make sure that everybody else keeps the law too. As to zeal, what's, what's zeal? To be zealous, to be excited, to be, to be excited about what he does. He does it with all the fervor, all of the passion that he can. It's not just by rote that he does it. He does it from the heart, obedient. And he goes on to say, I was a persecutor of the church. Why? As to righteousness, how? Under the law. The righteousness of the law, friend is not what you and I are held accountable to. It's the righteousness of faith. And listen to what he says. Righteousness of the law. What does he say? Blameless. Wow. How do you say blameless? Well, you know what he's saying? He says, I kept the whole law. I'm blameless. I did nothing wrong. I did everything that the law says all the time. And I made sure that everybody around did. And if they didn't, I ran around behind them and made sure that they were disciplined for that. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. If anyone has reason to boast, he says, in the law, in my own abilities, in my will, it's me. But listen to what he says about all of that. Because you see, the Apostle Paul, friends, had a high degree of self-discipline. A tremendous amount of self-discipline, a tremendous passion for holding high standards to the way he lived and the way that people around him lived. And he says, this is the benchmark right here. But listen to what he says about all that. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. All of that, all of that performance, all of that righteousness by the law, he says. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. His performance, he now counts as garbage that you just throw away. It's trash. His own, his own performance is trash. In order, why? That I may gain Christ and be found in Him not, listen, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. And he describes what that is, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let's go back because, you know, we use that word law. We go back, hey, we're not, we're not Jews. We're not 
keeping the 613 laws and all that goes along with that. How do we bring that forward to today? Well, let's read it again, and I'll, I'll read it a different way. Let's go back and, and we'll read, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing word of worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the laws of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him as not having a good performance in what I do here on earth in how I do in not committing sin in how I do in my performance and being on time at church in doing a good job at the things that I have signed up to do at how many times that I show up a week all of that works based he says listen I count all of them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own. Why? Because that's will worship, friends, that comes from the law. But what? What's His motive? That which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He has surrendered to the control of the Spirit and as the Spirit works through Him, friends, that is what he counts as gain. Not his own will, but the surrender of the will to the Lord God. Verse 10. So that, and I'm putting a so that, it's a purpose statement right there. So that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What's the power of Jesus' resurrection? Saving faith. It's grace. The power of Jesus' resurrection is your and my salvation. That I may know salvation. Why? And may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, friends, he is identifying himself with the Lord God, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ's actions on the cross because he is dying to self. He is dying to his will. He is dying to his ability to do well. And he says, if there's anyone who has a high degree of discipline around here, it's me. There's nobody that can hold to my standards. The Apostle Paul, blameless, kept the whole law. And he says, I count all of that as rubbish. And he's identifying with the Lord God by surrendering his will and his ability to do well in his own power and saying, it's not, it's not going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. I surrender to allow the Spirit of God to work through me. And so, friends, as we, as we walk through this text, we need to remember this, this recurring theme of surrendering control to the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to to work through us to accomplish what the Lord God has for you and I. What He has. And uh, a while back we went through the spiritual disciplines in our Tuesday evening class and we mentioned those a couple of weeks ago in one of, uh, in one of the sermons. But I want to I give you a quote out of that book, uh, Spirit of the Disciplines by uh, Richard Foster. And it's, he says this, Nothing can choke the heart and soul out of walking with God like legalism. And this is what's being spoken of here in the text today, is legalism. Rigidity is the most certain sign that the disciplines have spoiled. The disciplined person is the person who can live appropriately in life. And there's this story of, of Hans the tailor. And there was a businessman who had heard of Hans the tailor and his, and his wonderful ability to make these tailor-made suits. And so he contracted Hans the tailor to make a suit for him. And when he went to pick up the suit, he was going to wear the suit home on his trip home. And he changed into the suit. And it turns out that one of the sleeves had been twisted this way. One of the sleeves had been twisted this way. And the, the pants were a little bit askew. And one of the legs was longer than the other. And he had no option. He had to wear the suit. And so he put the suit on and he contorted himself into the suit and made it fit the best he could. Got on the bus to, to head over to, to the airport to, to go back home. And a person sitting on the bus looked over and recognized the work 
of Hans the tailor. And he, and he turned to the businessman and said, is that a suit that was made by Hans the tailor? Sheepishly, the man said, well, yes, yes it is. And the response of this person who asked the question was this. He said, well, I knew Hans the tailor was an amazing tailor, but for him to make a suit for someone as deformed as you and make it fit is quite amazing indeed. Often that's just what we do here at church. We get some idea of what the Christian faith should look like and then we show people in the most grotesque configurations so that they fit wonderfully. That's death. That's a wooden legalism when we place expectations on others. We begin to degenerate into legalism. We begin to destroy unity, friends. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. And these are warnings. See, we talked about this from the beginning of Philippians, that we don't struggle with these things here at Woodland Trails Baptist Church. But you see, the enemy does not like unity. And when he sees a body of believers like this one, that are, that are of one mind, that make choices and decisions that are spirit-led and are, and, and are led in the same direction and moving forward like, like you and I are. He doesn't like it. And so we always need to be on our guard and aware of the dangers of such things. So what's our motive? I mean, what it really boils down to is what is our motive for, for coming to church? What's our motive for coming to missional communities? What's our motive for attending Bible study on Tuesday? What's our motive for, for those of you who come on Sunday morning at 9.30 and stay for 11 and then come on Monday nights to sing? Like these folks that, that were here, wasn't that wonderful? They come every Monday night. There's a group of folks that meet every Monday night and they sing songs, sing praises to the Lord. What, what's our motive for that? What's our motive for serving? What's our motive for the, for the folks that come on Sunday and Tuesday as well as Thursday and are going through a book on prayer to, to go deeper into, in, into a, a prayer? What's our motive for that? Is it to earn God's favor? Are we to deliver a certain standard so He's pleased with us? Are we driven by guilt? What's, what's our motive for, for what we do? What is it? What's Paul talking about here with the, these dogs and these mutilators? If you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Romans and look at chapter 14. By the way, when you're turning there, uh, we're about to break into, on March the 17th, which is a Tuesday night, we will have wrapped up our study on Revelation. And we'll be moving into studying the book of Romans. But turn with me, if you will, to the book of Romans, and I'm going to read out of chapter 14 beginning in verse 13 in the book of Romans. And it speaks very specifically towards what I'm talking about. And I want us to examine this. as we, We're, we're going to have the Lord's Supper here in, in a little while. And this, is, this moves right into this discussion, and this, this examination. Listen to what it says here in verse 13 of chapter 14 of Romans. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather... Decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Let's stop there for a second. Earlier in our, our study here in Philippians, we were talking about this, this idea of excellence. And the idea of excellence, friends, is a faith that you have, keep between yourselves and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Again, back to what's our motive? Am I surrendering to the Lord? Am I allowing the Spirit of God to work through me? And is my life song an encouragement to others? Am I a stumbling block? Am I helping or am I harming? <laughs> so that he, he's talking about these folks that are seeking to destroy unity by the legalism of managing other people by their standards. Paul says, hey, if you want to, if you want to measure by standards, measure by my standards. I'm blameless. Measure by those. But I count all that as rubbish. Measuring people against their own standards, the motive, friends, is to control. That's the motive. 
So are we working? How, what's our motive? Are we working to look good before men? Or are we working to glorify God? Are we looking to feel good about you and me by what we do? Or is the motive to be a life song that sings glory to God for what he did? When people look at us, are we a mirrored reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they even see us? Are we a reflection of Jesus? Is it being pointed toward Him or maybe ourselves? Is our motive to glorify God? Faith is a settled trust that leads to obedience. Because it's very easy for us if we say, well, you know, if that's, if that's the truth, well then, you know, I guess I'm as best as I'm going to be, so I am who I am. But I want us to understand that our faith is going to lead us to obedience. It's a settled trust. When we say, I trust you, Lord, I'm going to surrender to you, automatically that's that work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The growth will occur. And friends, we know each other. We look around and we see folks have spiritually grown here by leaps and bounds. And we cannot take credit for that. That's glory to God for what he has done. He is doing amazing things in the lives of these people that are here at Woodland Trails Baptist Church beyond what anyone would have ever imagined. What a blessing that is. Let's continue to fight the good fight of faith and remember that it's the Lord that makes the increase and not ourselves. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Where's our heart? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. It's a very difficult message. But you planned it long ago. And I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of these here and the spiritual growth that is, that is being developed and birthed in every person here, Father. And I pray, Lord, that the work that you have done would continue and that you would get the glory. Fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish your purposes. And I praise you and thank you for what you're doing in the lives of each one of these here.